Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's last webinar in the eight-part series called Montana's Native People, Perspectives on the Clovis Child, hosted by the Yellowstone Gateway Museum. My name is Diane Chalfant, and I'm a volunteer and board member of the Yellowstone Gateway Museum here in Livingston, Montana. The Clovis Child refers to the 12,600-year-old Anzac site in Park County, Montana, the oldest known burial site in North America. Since it was first discovered in the 1960s, the site and the remains of the child buried there have been the focus of both cultural and scientific study. This series is career oriented and it's really directed toward college and high school students, especially tribal college students who are maybe considering careers in the fields related to our speakers work. So we've asked our speakers to talk about their work, their various perspectives on the Clovis Child site, and their personal journeys toward their professions. Today's webinar has been pre-recorded, so there won't be an opportunity to ask questions of Dr. White. However, after today's presentation, there will be a brief survey, and we do hope that you'll complete the survey. It'll help us improve our programs at the museum. We also encourage you to visit Yellowstone Gateway Museum's YouTube channel to watch the prior episodes of this series that you may have missed. Now, I'd like to introduce Yellowstone Gateway Museum's curator, Karen Reinhardt. Karen? Thank you, Diane. We also would like to thank Humanities Montana for funding the webinar series and the Montana Office of Public Construction for additional support. Today's speaker, Dr. Samuel Stockton White, is a longtime resident of Montana and he grew up in south of Livingston in the Paradise Valley. Dr. White attended the University of Montana beginning in 2009 to pursue a long desired education in anthropology and more specifically the subdiscipline of archaeology. He earned a BA in anthropology, an MA in cultural anthropology, and a PhD in applied anthropology from the University of Montana with both his MA theses and PhD dissertation focused on the ANZIC site. Currently, Dr. White works for the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, as an archaeologist addressing cultural resource management issues as they pertain to declared disasters occurring in any location in the United States or its territories. Please enjoy the presentation. And now I will share my screen and get things rolling. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. My name is Stockton White, and I would like to talk about my academic journey as well as the archaeology of the Anzig site. Before I get started, I want to thank both Karen and Diane and the Yellowstone Gateway Museum, as well as Humanities Montana, for making this series possible. To start, I have been interested in archaeology since I was a child. It all began for me following a passion for arrowhead hunting on the shores of tributaries to the Chesapeake Bay. Fishing and kicking around on these shores at a young age led me to the realization that our experience in this world is only a small part of the human continuum of occupations through the millennia, a point that has captivated me for decades. This lifelong passion combined with an ability to attend the University of Montana led to nearly 10 years of academic pursuit, to my ultimate goal of earning a PhD. To make it even more amazing, my wife, Dr. Teresa Lily White, also earned her doctorate, and we were able to both walk together at our doctoral graduation, a truly rare circumstance to be sure. I'm an archeologist, currently working for FEMA as a historic preservation specialist. My job with FEMA is to respond to declared disasters anywhere in the United States or its territories and work to identify cultural resources that may be affected by the disaster recovery efforts. I find this job to be very rewarding and challenging as the circumstances are ever changing with efforts to help communities recover, saving cultural resources and mitigating environmental damages being among the ultimate goals. Some of the educational requirements for this line of work as a government archaeologist are to earn a BA or BS in anthropology, and archaeology is one of the subdisciplines of anthropology. Then you should either earn a master's degree or PhD or both in anthropology. 
Additionally, it's a good idea to acquire at least two years of experience during your academic pursuit. This means actually doing archaeology as a field technician. This practical experience is very important when it comes to being hired and establishing career credentials in the workplace. My academic career took approximately 10 years to complete, with the BA in anthropology taking four years, my MA in cultural anthropology taking two and a half years, and my PhD taking approximately three and a half years. All told, this was at about 10 years in the making. All the while, I was able to spend many summers working for my longtime academic advisor, archaeology boss, and friend, Doug McDonald. While working for Dr. McDonald and the United and the University of Montana, I spent many weeks doing archaeology over the years in Yellowstone National Park, Warren Grove Air Force Base in New Jersey, F.E. Warren Air Force Base in Wyoming, Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada, and many other locations. Again, this practical experience cannot be overstated as it is very important in the process of qualifying for hiring in the profession of archaeology. Regarding the ANZIC site, I've been asked how it has influenced my personal and professional life. That answer is that I am honored to have been allowed to participate in research regarding the ancient peopling of the Americas as well as being part of the collaborative work that led to the reburial of the remains found at the Enzic site. It is about people and how we may work together with respect and empathy to make our world a better place to live. We're all in this together. Another question that I've been asked is why should young people consider a career in my field? My answer to this question is relatively simple. With anthropology being the study of people, I think it's important that we all understand with empathy and respect more about the many diverse cultures that make up the world populations. With this understanding, we, we can focus on helping each other instead of the alternative. And through archaeology, we are provided an informed window into the past that allows us to proceed into a mo more positive future. The most important part is to always continue to learn and archaeology allows us to learn while experiencing amazing landscapes and imagining how people lived in those landscapes for thousands of years. Now I would like you to watch a presentation regarding the archaeology of the Nancy site. Thank you. I hope you enjoy the presentation. The Enzic site is located in the Shields River Valley in South Central Montana between the Crazy Mountains to the east and the Bridger Mountains to the west. In this image, we are looking east with a gold arrow pointing to the Anzac site in the foreground and the Crazy Mountains in the background. Also, this image created by Tim Urbaniak shows the Anzac site hillside as it may have looked before the slope was removed during and after the day of discovery. The Anzac site is located in south central Montana near Wilson. Theoretically in line with the ice-free corridor, the location of the site potentially supports the contested theory of access to the area from central Alaska. There are several additional theories relating to the early people of the Americas, which are available online should you decide to investigate further. This is a note about radiocarbon dating. Radiocarbon dates versus calendar dates. Radiocarbon measurements are reported in terms of years before present, EP, or radiocarbon years before present, RCYBP. This figure is based directly on the proportion of radiocarbon found in the sample. Throughout the millennia, atmospheric radiocarbon concentration has varied. Therefore, the direct radiocarbon dates are calibrated to account for these variations, which gives us a calibrated or calendar date. For instance, in the case of the ANZIC dating, the radiocarbon found in several samples of the Clovis component dates to approximately 11,000 radiocarbon years before present, which, when calibrated in terms of atmospheric radiocarbon variation, equates to approximately 13,000 calibrated or calendar years before present. Dates in this presentation are in 
radiocarbon years before present, not calendar years. So what was discovered at the Anzic site? The Anzic site is a multi-component archaeological site, best known for the place of discovery of Clovis component that consists of 116 stone and bone artifacts found in association with the fragmented remains of a one to two year old boy, all covered with red ochre, dating to approximately 10,700 radiocarbon years before present. This is the only known Clovis burial in the world. Additionally, at the site, there's an early archaic component, which was found on the surface. It was sun bleached, fragmented remains of a six to eight year old human discovered approximately 30 feet distant and uphill from the buried ochre covered remains and artifact assemblage. The early archaic component was dated to approximately 8,600 years before present. So what is Clovis? Clovis is named for the location of discovery of the first Clovis projectile points, which is Blackwater Draw near Clovis, New Mexico. The Clovis culture is one of the oldest widespread inhabiting hunter-gatherer technological cultures in the Americas. According to Kilby and Huckle, 2013, the Clovis culture technology is known for its distinctive fluted projectile points. The Clovis toolkit represents a remarkable level of lithic mapping ability and an extremely efficient use of high quality lithic materials. The Clovis culture is thought to have existed between approximately 11,500 and 10,700 radiocarbon years before present, according to current publications, which is a relatively short time period of approximately 800 years, yet widely distributed throughout much of North America. The Anzac Clovis component consists of the partial remains of a human infant boy, along with 72 bifaces, seven unifaces, eight projectile points, 14 miscellaneous lithic fragments, 15 antler rod rod fragments, all of which are covered with red ochre. So what is red ochre? In this image, we see a large piece of hematite. Hematite is a naturally occurring substance that when crushed into powder form, as we see here, can be mixed with fats and proteins to create a paint known as red ochre. Red ochre is known to have been used around the world and through the millennia in ceremonies pertaining to burials. In the case of the Enzic site, Clovis component, the fragmented human remains, as well as the artifacts, were all thickly covered with red ochre. After the artifacts had been recovered, they were unfortunately washed off with most of the red ochre being removed. Although most was lost, as we will see, some residue of red ochre is still found in the contours of several of the artifacts. In this image, we see one of the bifaces, which retains a large amount of red ochre. In this image, we see another biface that holds a, a good amount of residual red ochre as well. This is an image of the Anzac site as it appears today. The site was discovered in 1968 by local contractors Ben Hargis and Calvin Sarver as they excavated angular stone from the slope. The stone was to be used in the construction of a septic system at the Wilsall High School. The site is named the Anzic site after the Anzic family, the owners of the land upon which the site was found. In this image, Calvin Sarver describes for me the day of discovery of the Anzic Clovis burial. Additionally, the gold arrow points out the locations provided by Sarver of the discovery of the early archaic remains. Here's an image of 50% of the Anzac Clovis assemblage, which is owned by the Anzac family. In this image, we see the other 50% broken down into 25% segments, 25 of which is owned by 
the Calvin Sarver family, and 25% of which is owned by the family of Ben Hargis. As described earlier, the bone rods found in the Anzic assemblage were in exceptional condition, especially considering their age. Here we see a close-up of a beveled end of a bone rod found in the Anzic assemblage. We can see the precision of the beveling as well as the condition of the hatch mark as though it was made just yesterday. Although we cannot be certain as to the meaning or use of the bone rods found in the Anzic Clovis assemblage, longtime Anzic site primary investigator, Dr. Larry Laren, along with Dr. Rob Bonnickson, proposed that the bone rods were used in a hafting process, which joined the fluted Clovis points to the bone four shafts, which in turn was used as a lance or spear, or possibly with an atlatl dart, for hunting the various megafauna associated with the Clovis time period. Such megafauna may have included mammoths, giant sloth, Northern American camel, or horse, to name a few possible prey species. Here we see a fluted Clovis lancelet point found in the Anzic artifact assemblage. Here's another Clovis fluted point found in the assemblage. In this image, we see one of the large bifaces from the Anzic assemblage. Evident in this image are the scar patterns across the face of the biface. These scars are from the removal of flakes, which were used as expedient tools, namely expedient blades, in the butchering of animals for food. Here we see the largest biface from the Anzic Clovis assemblage. As in the last image, we see flake scars, which are a result of the removal of expedient blades, thought to have been used for butchering purposes. Additionally, on the top margin of this biface, you will notice a U-shaped concavity. This concavity was likely used in the manufacture of the bone rods found with this tool assemblage. If you would like to understand more about this theoretical process, please refer to my PhD dissertation, the name of which is shown at the end of this presentation. Here we see a picture of the Anza Clovis assemblage as it currently appears at the Montana Historical Society Museum. In 2014, the Anza site was featured in Nature Magazine with the publication of the genome of a late Pleistocene human from a Clovis burial site in Western Montana. According to a Crow tribal member, the discovery proves something that tribal people have never doubted. We've been here since time immemorial and all the ancient artifacts located within our homelands are remnants from our direct ancestors. The discovery is only part of the importance of the study the other part being Eskel Willow's link and his team's respectful commitment to interacting face to face with tribal communities and listening to Native American leaders, which has led directly to the reburial of the remains. This publication of the genome of a late Pleistocene human from a Clovis burial site in western Montana validates that the concept of continuity in the history of Native Americans suggest that modern Native Americans are direct descendants of the first people occupying this land. Native American populations appear to be derived from a single source population. The Anzic site Clovis Boys family are the direct ancestors to approximately 80% of all present day Native Americans, with the remaining 20% being more closely related to this ancestral family than any other people on earth. As studies continue and additional evidence is discovered, we will know more using that these baseline data in the quest for further knowledge. The reburial of both sets of remains took place on June 28, 2014. 
With the help from my wife, Dr. Teresa Lily White, who is also an anthropologist, we dug the reburial pit at a location above the water table in the same rock layer and as close to the original burial as possible. As we remember, reburial at the original location was not an option due to the structure of the hillside being removed years before. Here's an image of the reburial as it took place on June 28, 2014. This reburial was presided over by Native Americans who allowed a small number of non-Native Americans, such as my wife and I, to participate in this amazing ceremony. This reburial ceremony was led by Crow tribal elder Larson Medicine Horse. Here we see Dr. Sarah Anzik in the red coat, gently holding the remains just before the reburial. During the reburial, men and women, both non-Native American and Native American, were split into the reburial back into the grave site. Here we see Dr. Eska Willerslev and Dr. Shane Doyle filling in the grave as members of the Anzic family watch. Here's the reburial grave after the reburial ceremony has taken place. It will be a day I never forget, and I am so honored to have been involved in the process and the ceremony. There are a small number of notable publications pertaining to the Anzic site and the discoveries there. In addition to a list of the publications pertaining to the site, these are references that I utilized in the completion of this presentation. Take a look and look them up. They are all excellent references pertaining to the Anzic site and Clovis uh, sites throughout the country. I am very grateful to Dr. Stockton White and to all of our presenters uh, during these webinars. We did receive a question last week about um, the ANZIC site um, and ANZIC site artifact. And I wanted to read that to you because Dr. White did answer the question. So the question was this, how were you able to identify the rabbit and camel proteins on the lithic material? And Dr. White's reply was, the rabbit and camel protein results were from a crossover process, I can't say the word, it's an analysis of six ANZIC lithic artifacts at the Paleo Research Institute in Golden, Colorado in October 2018. Basically, the analysis tested the artifacts for the existence of ancient animal proteins on their surfaces. So again, thank you to everyone who has participated, uh, speakers and um, the audience. We are also planning one more live Q&A session with most of the series webinar speakers this spring. You can learn about this program by visiting www.yellowstonegatewaymuseum.org and subscribing to our monthly e-newsletter or to join the Friends of the Museum to lend your support, which we greatly appreciate. You may also subscribe to our YouTube channel so you'll be notified of future recorded programs. Until next time, Stay safe and be well. Thank you very much. Bye.